Hello and welcome to something a little bit different today. We're going to have a look at the uh, exciting British dodgeball rules for this season uh, for a couple of reasons. I think it's important that all of the players and referees uh, have some idea of the, the changes that have gone on in the rules, uh, both for the referee's sake, so that they're calling the right things, for the players' sake, so, so that they understand what the referees are saying when they call the right things, even though they think that, you know, previously in the rules that wasn't how it was. Um, and so that everyone really understands like what's going on in the game at the minute uh, to make sure that the rules are kind of what the community wants ultimately. Um, and then also just to highlight some things that are maybe not as clear as they need to be because uh, if they're being if they're open to interpretation in the wrong way, then those rules aren't really doing the function that they should be either. And a referee could be well within their rights to call something that is ultimately not what the rules intend. Um, British Dodgeball are constantly trying to review these things and, and, and make sure they're, they're clear. Um, and it's a work in progress, but I think the bit that they're lacking at the minute is uh, getting the kind of notice out to players that things have changed. Um, which is hard to do when you're changing so much, but hopefully that's something we can work towards. We saw some more transparency from British Dodgeball with the um, disciplinary spreadsheet that we've got, and I hope that we can keep uh, moving towards that kind of transparent side of things. Um, and not just transparency, like with changing the rules, it's, it's about communication and making sure that all the players and referees are up to date on these things, because it's hard to keep track of all the like really small changes that happen. So let's have a look. Uh, through the rules. I've gone through and highlighted uh, some areas that I want to look at, most of which I don't want to go through everything, obviously, because there is a hell of a lot. Hopefully you're looking at the length of this video right now and it is not uh, two hours long. It's just the once one, actually. Fingers crossed. So, uh, yeah, we'll just skim through to things that, that I think are important. Um, if you haven't seen already, the court size has been updated, so the court is a little bit longer, potentially, in the most... In, in ideal arenas and sports hall, sports halls, um, we have the option to have the EDF sized center zone with uh, double, basically double the neutral zone than uh, that we used to have in the British dodgeball rules. The throwing distance would always stay the same. So the if the neutral zone gets bigger, the back line also moves back. You're still throwing from the same range. So the, the size of the core also changes with the neutral zone. Um, but there is flexibility for smaller sports halls to have no neutral zone and just have a central line instead. So that neutral zone can range from EDF size down to nothing. Um, the court is also a little bit wider at the same time, where allowed between 8 and 9 meters. 8 is what we used to have, 9 is the wider version. Um, which playing in the uh, English Open at St George's Park um, felt good. Yeah, it's cool to have a bigger neutral zone because I, I always thought the smaller one was a bit. Um, it looked a bit weird when you look at a court diagram to have these like three lines really close to each other. Personally, on this, I, I do like the the range. I think the bigger court is the the better version of the sport, um, and but you need that flexibility there for smaller halls because otherwise we won't be able to play dodgeball anywhere. Um, I, I do think that having a varying core is a downside. I'd rather we didn't, but I think this is the better way to do it. Um, however, I think that there needs to be three set dimensions of the biggest neutral zone, the middle neutral zone that we used to have, that we most of us know, and then no neutral zone, rather than a range between all of them uh, because those neutral zones between 0.75 meters either side and zero, you end up with like a neutral zone that, well, my foot fits almost entirely across the neutral zone. It's like one and a bit of my feet. And my feet are like kind of large, but like that's, it's not really a neutral zone. It looks, it looks silly, to be honest. Um, and I don't think we need that. I think just having three set sizes would be a little bit smarter. Um, on to the next thing. They have put this in the rules. Um, 
the kind of thing that happens in every game that every player does and then strives to not do because we don't want to be talking back to referees and having a go at things. But like the, the fact of the matter is you need to clarify what has happened. They have this in the rules just to be clear. Um, players are permitted to ask referees non-aggressive questions when play has stopped about the outcome of a recent play uh, that was not fully clarified by the referee. Obviously, this is a little bit of a grey area because everybody talks to the referees to ask what has happened when play has not stopped either because you kind of need to know what's going on. Am I out? Did it bounce? I thought he was caught. I thought he was out. All of that stuff. Um, but they are trying to kind of add some points in here to say, uh, to not just say, never talk to the referees. That's a media blue card. You know, you have to allow players to, to communicate. Um, but obviously, you should be going through the, the coach or captain if you've got a, a, a serious complaint or um, you're trying to, you know, make a point about a play that happened that you think was called wrong. Mixed. Does specify now that you need uh, three of a single gender. You can't have four women and two men and a mixed team. Um, I'm not sure how long this has been in here, but just to be clear for anyone who's going to be in mixed league soon um, you do have to have um, three of each you can't um, fill in the gaps with with women just in case you weren't aware the start of a tournament you need four players to fill a team this probably will apply to most teams but just in case you're very short on a day car doesn't arrive um, stuck in traffic etc you need four for the first game of a day event <clears throat> of an event day and then three for subsequent matches to allow for, I guess, injuries of that extra person, if that car really doesn't turn up. Uh, during the game, once you've made the first set, there is no minimum, so you could start with one person on each set. It's quite interesting. Each playing team can have a maximum of two coaches during each match they play in. So usually it was one person in the box before, now you can have two. You still need one of those to be the representative that talks to the official, um, but you can have two coaches. Uh, I mean, best application of this is one person is concentrating on the timer, the other person is trying to think about subs, tactics, all that. Uh, also to those who don't know, this has, I think, been, I think been in the rules since last year. Might be wrong, but either way. Uh, you, a coach is allowed to touch any stationary ball that is in the player return area. I think that was in there before. But also may change the direction of a dodgeball or touch a ball that is outside of the player return area, provided they do not leave this area and do not risk making contact with any players, retrievers or officials. So that does mean that if you stand with your two feet in the box and a ball hits the back wall, you can put your hand out and stop it from going back the coach can basically be your third retriever that means if you're in a back wall situation or something like that you can have two retrievers one on one side of the court one on the back of the court and then the coach on the third side of the court can kind of do a bit of a job of stopping balls from going back on that side that's the best way to um in a back wall situation especially to try and maximize getting all the balls use that coach as a retriever more on retrievers as well, you can have a maximum of three now, only if both teams agree to it, so the standard is two. Uh, but if both teams have three retrievers available, then they can agree beforehand that they'll have three. Um, as a referee as well, if it's uh, if both teams are fine with it, then if a third retriever turns up later in between sets and they're saying, can we add a third retriever in? I think that's fine, personally. I'm not going to stop both teams from agreeing with that. But if one team denies it, then... That's it. They, they can say that. They can say, you all want to stick with two. A retriever is only allowed to field balls that are outside the court, obviously, so it always was. But now, that are fully in the air over the court if all of the following apply. All of the following. Not one of them, all of them. They do not risk initiating contact with any player or court or official. That makes sense. No part of their body makes contact with the court. That makes sense. That would be a turnover. The ball is not a live ball. Obviously, you can't reach in and get a, a stop a thrown ball from hitting a teammate. And they are not otherwise interfering with play. Interfering with play is a little bit of a loose term. I don't know where the line is here exactly. 
and I'm sure there will be grey areas with what is classed as interfering with play. I do have an example for something later on, because interfering with play is used a fair few times. You can actually come down here to some examples that they gave for Retriever specifically about interfering with play. A Retriever interfering with play, excluding such including events such as shielding an on-court player, as in stopping them from getting hit by a live ball, putting off an opposition player, as in faking like you're going to throw, even though you're a retriever, can't do that, taking a ball that an on-court player has possession of, as in taking a ball out of your teammate's hand if they don't want you to, but also taking it off the opposition's hand, you can't do that. It'd be funny, but you can't. Uh, it should be sanctioned. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Genuine attempts to gain possession of a ball for their team are not classed as interfering with play. So the way I read this is if uh, the other team throws a ball at the back wall, it's bouncing back, and it's clearly going to go back over to their side, you want to keep that ball for your own team instead, you can reach over the court and bat the ball back to your own team, even though it's clearly going back to the other team. That's a genuine attempt to get uh, to gain possession of the ball for your own team, which is interesting. It does take a bit of the grey area around, was that ball um, over the court still when you hit that? Was it outside of the court still when you hit that? Um, and you only have to really pay attention to, was the retriever stepping onto court to stop that ball from going back? It's an interesting one. I think it's fine. I actually think it makes back wall a, like that the slightest bit less less bad for teams that can't get possession because sometimes you know in a three minute set you get possession like three or four times before you're all out because they just keep hitting it against the wall every time they miss they get the ball back and every time they hit they get the ball back so it gives a little bit of possibility for the retrievers to be able to reach in and get a ball back um, which might help just a little bit so back to interfering with play and what that really means and the, the gray areas um, another example that came up at the weekend was a uh, a retriever um, actually stepped onto court to um, tell a player that they needed to step off in order to get the final set for the team to be able to pull back a win. The retriever stepped onto court to tap the player on the shoulder and say, uh, you need to step off, that's what your teammates are trying to tell you from the outbox. Um, in that specific situation... It seems like that was fine. I mean, it would be a turnover because the the retriever has stepped onto court. It would be a turnover because the retriever has touched a live player. But does that class as interfering with play? If the retriever had not only just tapped the player on the shoulder, but had physically pulled them off court, does that class as interfering with play? If the other team was two or three seconds away from winning the whole game because that player was not going to step off and then the retriever say pulls the player off court at the last second because they realize that player is not going to step off in time have they interfered with play they have changed the result of the game they have caused a, an extra set to happen yes they forfeited the set for their own team and the turnover is irrelevant because um the set is over but they've changed the outcome of the game with their actions. And importantly, interfering with play is a more severe punishment for the retriever and could result in a, I think, yellow card for for interfering with play intentionally. Say, blocking a ball that is a live ball that is thrown, that's a yellow card. I don't know. This is this is just one example of another grey area that that could come up. And I think interfering with play needs to. It needs to keep evolving in its definition so that we kind of better understand it and cover as many grey areas as possible. Because people will find them. That happened at the weekend, and that is a situation that I would say that a lot of people might say you making you know you making absurd situations that aren't clear. But like, what does a referee do in that situation? They they need to as they these things happen, we need to better define them because in the moment the referee is going to have to use their judgment call. And a referee using their judgment to make up a rule in the moment is never going to feel fair to either team. Anyway, moving on. Spectator interference. Uh, this is something that has happened in 
uh, happens quite a lot and I think I was a bit unclear about what I was meant to do and then I finally did get to this point and I realise now um, spectators may return a ball that has gone out of bounds uh, by giving it to an official or a retriever or throwing it back onto the court. That's really what happens normally. Um, efforts should be made by those outside the playing area to return the ball to the appropriate team depending on where the ball has gone out of bounds. Spectators should, in general, return the ball to the side where the ball currently is as if the centre line had been extended beyond the playing area. So I've, I've drawn a little diagram down here. This is my fantastic artwork. Um, the dotted line is the court boundary, say the net, and this is the playing area. If you can't work that out, then I need to go back to art school. I need to go to art school. Um, if the ball comes off the court, uh, say it rebounds off a player from over here, flies over to the other side outside of the net, it went over the net in this side, however, the ball has landed here, so it should just go back to the team here. The, uh, return the ball to the side where the ball currently is on. It shouldn't be thrown back over to the other side, it should just be thrown straight onto court here. If the ball is thrown back over to the other side, at their discretion, referees may choose to adjust the possession of a ball which is returned as court into an unfair manner. I would say a lot of the time this isn't going to need to be done. If teams kind of have no have no objection to it, if it's a three ball versus two ball situation, um, a lot of the time teams will just kind of like play on and not really pay too much attention to it because three versus two balls is a bit unclear who has the advantage overall there because some teams like two, some teams like three, etc. If it's a four ball, if it's a five ball situation, then um, the players are kind of within their right to say we should have got that ball back and it's uh, at the ref's discretion to give that ball back to the player. Um, I think personally I would try and do that as much as possible where it puts a team at a serious disadvantage um, and I have noticed that the ball has definitely come over from the wrong side. Um, if I'm unsure then I can't trust them that the ball came from the other side. I can't just be like, oh, you said the ball came from over there, so therefore I'm going to give you that ball back, and suddenly you don't have four balls, you have five balls, something like that. Uh, moving down to the uh, match set, match is set regulations. Four starts have got a little bit of a change, but we'll cover those uh, better later. Um, we just need to remember this key point that at the event of any false start, the final set timer and sanction timers will be reset. So say there's a final one minute or 30 second set and somebody false starts. Um, it's a turnover. We'll cover that more later. You give five balls, if that's how many they want, to the team. Um, and then restart the timer from 30 seconds or one minute. Not necessarily for longer sets earlier in the game, but specifically for short sets, reset the timer. Um, and then also, in terms of shorter sets and overtime sets, I think this is something that most teams wouldn't realise, and I did not realise until I read this. Choice of sides for the overtime set should be determined by a coin toss. Coin toss. Now, most arenas have some kind of side bias. One side is stronger than the other. Um, it's got a net behind it, so you capture more of the balls. All of that jazz. I think in the last few weeks, most teams won't have really realised that they could have protested having the side that they've got, the bad side, for the overtime set. Um, but you can say to the referee that I don't like the side that we're on and I would like to determine this with a coin toss. Obviously, it might not go in your favour, but you shouldn't just be given the side default. What I will say is it should be done quickly, and this is the kind of thing that can really delay a game if you throw up a big fuss. So this is the kind of thing that I'm talking about when the referees need to know the rules and the players need to know the rules, so the player can just come to the referee and said, I'd like to uh, be on the other side, can we uh, toss a coin? Okay, cool, coin toss, switch sides, done. Nice and quick. So on to the start of sets now, and on to uh, full starts, etc. Um, quite a few rules that I want to look at here. After the ready command has been issued, as in line up, ready, go, there it is. Uh, any player who lines up late after the referee has issued the ready instruction, instruction may still join the game by stepping onto court as outlined in 5.2. 
as in you're trying to make quick substitutions, you haven't got onto the court in time, and the referee says, line up, team's ready, go. Ah, I need to get onto court. Jump onto court as quick as you can, because you have until, if you go down here, 5.2. That's not the right rule. Here we go. Um, in fi under 5.2, The structure's a little bit, the numbering is not ideal, um, but 7.1 under 5.2. If a player has not stepped onto court by the first rusher from either team has made contact with the ball on the center line, that player will be called out. So if you're stood on the back line, looking at the birds, not really paying attention, the rush starts and then someone touches a ball and then you step off the back line, you're out. You've stepped off too late. And the same applies for players that are not on court when the rush starts. You've just got to uh, get both feet into the court before anyone touches a ball in the middle, which is like, you know, you've got like two seconds to react if, if that. People are fast. So coming back up here, sanctions may be given to players who consistently line up late or purposefully move before the go command. Um, I've talked to people before. I've had this idea myself. Um, you could just stand on court like before the set starts and b before the ball return line and like it not be a problem. But they have put this in the rule now. If you keep doing that, uh, or you're purposefully moving before the go command to try and confuse the referees, um, you will be sanctioned. And I think that's fair. Uh, also, should a player, uh, should a team start more than six players, then this will be classed as a false start. So if you start with seven players, false start. If I'm sure I had some notes here. Ooh, comments. Here we go. If blue carded, starting with a six is also a false start. So if you're meant to have five players on court, that would mean that starting with six is a false start. Uh, false starts. What is a false start? A false start used to mean that you gave the other ball over to the other team and then everyone would run in and someone would get smashed from close range or you just give them five balls. Uh, not anymore. It's a turnover. The penalty is a turnover. That's it. Um, you don't have to get five balls. Um, you can strategically only take two balls, say, if you want. Um, false starts are not called out for players who move between ready and go. This has been a rule for a while, but just remember, if you false start, just stop before the return line and tell someone else to go. Like, it's that simple. Or give them five balls if, you know, no one's running, you're not going to get there in time. Um, that's just completely an option. Um, yeah, so stop before the return line. It's now just a turnover. Um, but you still have the option to not take five balls and take three balls or two balls. So this is a bit for turnovers in general. Um, although play ceases, game time should generally not be paused for a turnover unless the sanction is uh, given briefly before set time expires. Briefly before set time expires? Actions of the offending team which occur between the foul occurring and play ceasing for the penalty are subject to the advantage rule. E.g. if a hit is made between the sanctionable action taking place and the referee ceasing play. So there you go. Uh, this happened to us on the weekend. Uh, one of our players false started and then was hit by the quick start on the other team. And then the referees realized that there was a false start. Um, they reset the play. Uh, they The other team got the five balls and we got our player back in. And they actually reset the clock as well. I think not knowing the rules inside and out, that was a perfectly reasonable solution. Um, however, they should have been uh, subject to the advantage rule and the hit should have stood. And they should have got five balls, which is pretty wild because instead of getting one hit from the five ball attack, kind of likely, um, you're actually going to get two hits from the... Uh, you're probably going to get two hits from it. That's, that's a wild advantage, but hey, don't fall start. Um, just stop before the ball return line. That's that's the thing, um, yeah. So that advantage rule, if the if the referees don't realise that the line ref is calling for a false start, but though I, this briefly before set time expires, you shouldn't pause game time unless briefly before set time expires. What is briefly? I think you need to use a little bit of context uh, and also from the other rules to say that a thirty second set in a tournament, you would reset the clock. So under 30 seconds i would i would definitely pause time under a minute i think i would also pause time because that's the um that's the like overtime or uh 
overtime or final set time as well. Over, say, a minute, I would try to, say, turn over and uh, send the balls over immediately. And then if it doesn't happen straight away, if, if there's any kind of, uh, sorry, what I don't understand, then I would pause time. Because it could be that the team who committed the turnover is intentionally trying to waste time by um, feigning not understanding what is going on. Personally, I will pause time if it seems like excessive time is going to be taken to sort out this turnover. Uh, And I will also pause time probably, well, under 30 seconds, probably under a minute, especially if it's relevant to the the context of the set and the game. Um, If it's 16-0 and one player's six, one player's up, then maybe with 50 seconds left, I won't pause time. Resetting or resuming play. Play will resume from a point in play... uh, Play will resume from the point play was paused with regards to eliminations, players, and ball possession. Uh, I didn't highlight this, but this is a note to all referees. Um, I think that sideline referees need to be um, semi-responsible for counting the number of players and balls when time is paused. I think you need to say that before a game to say... Line refs, if I ever pause time, what I want you to do first of all is to count how many players are on your side and count how many balls they have because in five minutes when you unpause the time, you will not remember how many players there are. Full stop. You will not remember. You should also count them yourselves, but the line refs need to help you in that responsibility because you can't do everything. This happens so many times and there's been so many problems intentionally, accidentally, I don't know, but... If, we, if the referees start counting the players, then it's going to help. Um, also, I'm not sure if this is a slight change to the rule or not, um, but this is what the rule says. Uh, with the exception being that teams may take possessions of any balls that were in the half court uh, when time is paused. So time is paused, ball's in the middle, but on your side slightly, you can go and get that ball. You don't have to leave it where it is, uh, which can change the play quite a bit. But, you know, know your rights. Go get that ball. Uh, players must promptly step fully onto court with both feet once play has resumed. Any players attempting to gain an advantage by delaying stepping onto court may be subject to sta- sanctions for unsporting behaviour. I think the worst side of this is quite clear. If a player doesn't step on in time, then you should be uh, calling them out. I mean, that's the, the first one. Um, if they are clearly trying to uh, gain an advantage somehow, then that would be a yellow for unsporting behaviour. I'm not sure what you could do, possibly, that would be that severe. Um, But then the other side of it is I want to kind of encourage referees to be uh, understanding about this kind of thing. Um, If it is, if it's an experienced team, but there is, you know, it's reasonable that they didn't realise that the set had started or something like that, or they've not stepped off yet, but it clearly hasn't interfered with play. Say their team is on the attack and they're still sort of on the back line for a second. That's not interfering with play whatsoever. It's made no difference. If they are on the receiving end of an attack, then they have have made a difference and then they should be called out. And if they're stood on the back line for 10, 15 seconds, then yeah, okay, call them out. But don't just call out even experienced players or newer players uh, because they didn't step off within five seconds and their team's on the attack. Yeah, it's just not necessary. It's not the point of the rule. Exiting players. Upon deemed out, an exiting player must raise at least one hand over their head, not two. This is important because a lot of players may only raise one hand, and then previously the referees have said, um, it doesn't matter that you hit that player with one hand up because they should have had two hands up. Now it is only one hand. Personally, not a huge fan of this. I think you should have two hands up to make it completely clear to the player that is throwing. I don't think that someone should be penalised because you you went like this when you're backtracking. And they didn't realise that that meant you were out. Because this is a movement that happens all of the time uh, when you're not. So every time you... (laughs) To be really extreme, every time you go like this, then I'm like, oh, he's out. Oh, he's not out. Oh, he's not out. Oh, no, he's out. Is he out? I'm not sure. That's a bit of an extreme example, but like people put their hands up to be sorry or something like that. And that would mean that... um, uh, One, I would be punished if I... um, Assumed that that didn't mean they were out and I hit them. And two... I would be punished if I put my hand up like that to say sorry and the ref said, oh, you've just called yourself out by doing that, so you're out. And I'll be like, I apologise to someone for accidentally hitting them in the head. That's kind of harsh. Personally, I think it should be two hands. 
Um, but the rule st currently states one hand. Very important. Any player who is adjudged to have deliberately thrown at a player who is indicating they are out, despite having ample time to stop, uh, will be called out. So I think that's important to note that you would be called out and not a sanction immediately. If it's a completely accidental thing, then that's kind of like okay sanction-wise. Say, say you were trying to throw a no-look throw across the court, you were countering one person and you threw a cross at that person and then realised, oh, they're out, I've just released my ball, I'm so sorry, the referee should be saying, I understand you didn't mean to do that intentionally, you hit them in the body, it's okay, you're out though, unfortunately. Um, if if you throw at someone who is clearly out from close range with no regard for their personal safety, then it's a sanction. Otherwise, it's an accident, but you're out. Any player who is adjudged to have thrown an invalid attempt due to not having ample time to realise they were throwing at an invalid target and subsequently attempting to stop their throwing motion will not be called out for an invalid attempt. So a player is hit out, up court, a second player goes to try and hit them, realises they're out, I shouldn't try and hit them for their own safety and because I actually want this ball, and they try and stop, they don't, and the ball falls over the other side of the court, not an out. Do not call that player out. I've done that. I accidentally called the player out. They said I was trying to stop to not hit that player. I realized that is actually what happened. Call them back in. That's fine. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to try and stop for the safety of the player and also just for your own possession. Another thing on interfering with play, an exiting player must exit the court as quickly as possible or the nearest sideline or backline. They must then make their way to the queue without interfering with play. I don't have any specific examples that I think on like borderline or a grey area but again I, th I think it might be a grey area let's keep trying to expand that into what exactly we mean by interfering with play um, which might be when it happens we need to get that into the rules when we work out what it should be for example a player falling off court if an exiting or returning player stops them from falling off court then that's probably interfering with play but I think there's a line there's, there's an example somewhere where people aren't sure. Um, an exiting player must not intentionally impact play. Should an official determine they have done so, they will receive a yellow card and a turnover will be called against their team. So I think this is this is definitely something that, you know, was understood before that if you are hit out, you should go out. Don't think that's revolutionary. Um, however, examples of impact to play. Continuing to throw after being hit out. Again, like this is obvious that you shouldn't do that and people will complain when people throw too late. Um, I just want to kind of remind people of that, that like if you're hit out, you should be immediately out, not out in two or three steps, not out after faking, um, not out after releasing your ball, but that's kind of, that's an obvious one, but like it, you shouldn't be hit, continue a counter, make the person think that they've been countered by you, and then stop, and then your teammate blasts them from the other side when they weren't expecting it. Like, that's cheating. Just gonna say it. Um, and my point here mainly being that referees have the ability to penalise this definitely. Like, you, you need to be yellow carding people for this. I know it's hard on the day to do it, but you have the ability to yellow card people for this. Um, and at the same time, just be smart about it. Did they have a reasonable opportunity? Was it a ball that they think they may have been bounced bounced or something like that? Um, is it one that you are 70% sure hit them and you're calling them out on the balance of probabilities Then, and they were convinced that they're not out? Then maybe, maybe that's not yellow card worthy if they carried on. Um, but if you know that they should have known that they're out for 100% certainty... Um, and they continue for an unreasonable amount of time in a way that impacts the play, uh, then that's a yellow card. Full stop. Returning players. Uh, similar to uh, before, interfering with play. Uh, though I actually gave this example here. Um, for example, stopping a player falling off court when you are returning before you've got back onto the court, you are interfering with play. If you high-five a live player from off-court, that's not interfering with play. And I don't think there is anything in these rules that actually stops you from uh, 
high fiving a live player from off court. Like there is nothing that means that that player would be out or that you would be out if you've not interfered with play. Just to be clear. I don't think the rules say anything about a player being out if touched by a returning player or dead player. The player is still in. However, there is a part here that says if a play, if any if any part of a player's body touches an external surface beyond their fair territory, uh, the player shall be deemed out. I.e., a backline, sideline, opposition's neutral zone, outside of the court, or opposition's exclusive playing zone. I don't think that that actually covers dead players, returning players, and retrievers. I mean, it doesn't name any like people in here if you touch the coach or something like that. Um, and personally, as a referee, again, I would not call people out for things that do not impact the play. If somebody, it, even if somebody high fives their coach from on court into the coach's outbox. I'm not going to call that player out because that has not interfered with play. That is not the intention of the rules, uh, the structure of the rules that we have to keep people, <clears throat> you know, playing against each other in this defined set of rules, um, which I understand. I understand it shouldn't be necessarily the intention of the rules, but what the rules say, I don't think the rules say that you can't touch a live or dead player. Um, so that's how that's how I would see that. Um, that I mean, look, right. Let's be honest. It doesn't matter if you like high five a dead player that just made a catch and out, and you're like, nice high five. Oh, I'm out as well. I'm like, what? What are we doing? Why are we playing this game if we if we're gonna do stuff like that? It just doesn't it doesn't need to be called like that. Um, and once again, I do not think the rules are clear enough to say that that should be an out either. Uh, so, just to go back to returning players, um, the point that I was trying to make, sorry, is this includes gaining possession of uh, an off-court dodgeball and carrying it onto court. If you are returning from the outbox and pick up a ball and take it onto court, that's a turnover. Don't do that. I have done it. It was embarrassing. I thought it was out. It thankfully wasn't. But uh, man, is the person who made that catch going to be real mad at you. Uh, on to specifics from out. Um, same as what I said before. In accordance with the British Dodgeball Code of Conduct, all players should leave the court when knowingly out without requiring a call to be made by the referee. Without requiring a call to be made by the referee. Without requiring a call to be made by the referee. Without requiring a call to be made by the referee. Any player who does not do so, where the referees deem that they could not reasonably have believed they were not out, should be sanctioned for unsportsmanlike conduct. I feel like I am on two sides of a coin here, where part of me is saying, hey, don't cheat, and the other part of me is saying, you have to give people a little bit of leniency for things that they really don't know about. If it hits them on the foot, and it's a nice, nice, absolute missile that you've thrown, and you think it's nailed them on the foot, you have to give them some leniency to be able to ask the referees whether that was indeed a hit, because a lot of players go out for bouncers when they shouldn't have, and that's not fair on them either. If a player dodges on the floor and is looking in a different direction, clearly can't see it, then that player does not know whether or not they have been hit cleanly. If it bounces and then hits them, that actually feels the same when you're not looking. So you have to give them a bit of leniency. If you have nailed them in the chest from three yards away, and then they pretend that they haven't been hit, you have a bit of a right to complain. You just have to be a little bit understanding when people don't know. Um, onto blocking, uh, there is a bit in catching about if you get hit by one ball, the only thing you can do is try and catch that ball. You can't, you know, throw another ball and then try and catch the ball that hit you. The only thing you can do is try and catch that ball. Um, the same thing is now in the blocking rules as well. Uh, the player is out the moment they have lost con uh, control of their blocking ball. The only action they may take is to recover control of that lost ball before it touches any surface or other player. Um, so I think before, if you lost control, um, you could then say catch another ball that came in, or even the same ball. Um, now, with the way that the rules are written, if you lose control and you then take a catch, that doesn't count um, because you need to have recovered the ball that you lost. To be clear, you're not out, 
if you catch that second ball, if you then manage to recover the blocking ball, but that catch actually doesn't count in the meantime. It's got me wondering, actually, just going back to the... Well, it's back to the hit players in this section. Um, a player must not do anything to eliminate an opponent until they have caught the deflected ball, which initially hit them. Catches made by the hit player are void unless they catch the deflected ball, thus saving themselves and being eliminated. Yeah, so if you get hit by one ball and it goes up in the air, you catch the second, um, the catch is void. We know that already. Even if you... But, to be clear, even if you then go and recover the ball that, you know, bounced up first, you're not out from being hit by that second ball, which I, some people might think, and I might have thought that before, um, but now, specifically in the rules, it says you can take that second catch. It doesn't count for a catch, but you're not out. And then you catch the ball that hit you first, and that catch would count. Same with losing control. Uh, On to stalling. The rules here have had a little bit of an update. Not sure I entirely like it, but I appreciate the <clears throat> the attempt at clarification and the attempt of kind of unifying what referee is going to do. Play ball. If the referee's burden count has expired and the team in question has not made an attempt and does not appear like they will have made an attack within the next one to two seconds, then the officials will call play one play end balls. I.e., if they're stood at the back of the court and you get to zero, it doesn't look like they're like you know making a call and walking up, then you call play balls. Referees should not call play end balls if the team appears like they will attack within the next one to two seconds, are in the process of throwing motion, e.g. are in the process of a throwing motion, or are walking up court. If this team does not initiate an attack in the next one to two seconds, however, then the referee should call play end balls immediately. I don't think this is exactly clear in what they mean by initiate an attack. So if they're stood at the back and you get to zero, and then it looks like they're making a call and going to walk up and, you know, attack. Does that mean, is that the is that the whole action of walking up? Because then if they stand there for a further one or two more seconds, I'm going to call play ball. I think that's a kind of a given. If they walk up, but it takes more than one to two seconds, if their whole walk up is quite slow and it takes three seconds, should I have called play ball? Or is that what you're saying it looks like they have initiated an attack? If a team does not initiate an attack, because I think they have initiated an attack because they're on the move up looking like they're going to throw. If it's excessive and they are walking extremely slowly, then I think I would call play ball. If they fake, then I would call play ball if it's been a long time. If you throw one fake and then step forward and throw, no. But if you throw a fake and step back, then yeah, play ball. But I think this inter- this these rules leave open the interpretation that if you get to zero and they start walking up, that you should then start a second timer. Zero, one, two. They haven't thrown a ball yet, even though they're walking forward, even though they're in the action, then I should call play ball uh, during that walk up. And I think that is... I think that is incorrect, but could be interpreted as correct by the rules. I also think it's incorrect in terms of what the point of the rules and what we're trying to do here is. I think it goes against the point of the stalling rule for stop. What I will say is that players could abuse a very slow walk-up in order to delay the game and take a long time. If that is their, if they if they're doing that, then I would call play ball. If I think that they are delaying the game, if they do that on every single throw, I may warn them earlier in the game that. If this, if this becomes a situation where the other team is time pressured, then I would see this as stalling the game. I might not when there's three minutes left, but I might see this, I might when there's 30 seconds left. Um, because that's the point of the stalling, right? There is no point in stalling the game at three minutes at the first set of the first game. You know, there's no benefit to stalling the game whatsoever. But when you suddenly, when you have a benefit from stalling, then the stalling rule needs to be like done to the letter of the law. And I think you are stalling if you are walking up extremely slowly. So my point here being, I think there needs to be a little bit of clarification about um, what you should class as an attack here. Is it the throwing motion itself or is it walking up um, to make sure that people aren't calling play ball uh, when teams are like in the motion of throwing. So another point here on play ball, 
When a play occurs during the burden count that alters the number of balls the team due to initiate has on their side of the court, the referee should judge how many balls the team is in possession of at the point at which they are about to call play and balls, regardless of how many balls are in the possession of when the referee began their burden count. This is a long sentence. Uh, e.g. where the team initially has possession of three balls, does not initiate an attack, but clearly gains possession of two further balls, with two seconds left in the burden count, the referee may call play four balls. So, you got to be, you got to think about what this actually means uh, in terms of what possession actually is as well. Someone said this to me the other week, and I think this is kind of the way you should do it. If you are on zero, if you are on zero and the team is still is walking up to make an attack, you're like, I'm not calling play ball yet because I shouldn't. And then the other team pre-throws, sends two balls across. Um, you should, uh, and the team stops and says, we're going to hold. Then you should immediately call play two balls. Not play four balls because that team does not have those balls in their possession. The caveat to this is, um, say the pre-throw happens and... Uh, someone makes a catch. So actually, immediately they've got four balls in their hands, then it should be play three. Or even if it bounces and then someone has it in their hands straight away, it should be play three because they've got those balls in their possession. If the balls are flown off the back of the court, they do not have them and they should not be included in the possession for the play and balls. So that's a, I think that's a, a good rule that somebody else gave to me. Um, that if you get, if a pre-throw happens and the team obviously says stop, then you should call play balls on the ones that walked up, whether that's uh, play two when they've got three or play three when they've got four. Uh, not too many left now. We're skipping quite far ahead to headshots and face shots. Um, there is no penalty for a headshot in normal play unless. So in general, headshots, not a problem, as we all know, with some uh, certain caveats uh, that they're, they're trying to refine these over the years to make them make it a safe place for players because we don't want headshots but it is still part of the game you can't say that people aren't out if they're hitting the head we're trying to make it safe um those caveats being close range less than four meters uh, a direct attempt as in intentional uh, at a target who is static in a standing or static high kneeling position uh, before the attacker begins their throwing motion. I'm not going to go through the rest of that just yet. Um, but that, those are the three points. Um, and it must meet all of those criteria. So it's it's close range. It's intentional. And the target is static. It also says like moving back in a straight line. But um, essentially um, the point is if you throw a ball. then And you threw it at the head. like Then the head will always be in the same position. Given the trajectory of the ball. That's kind of the, the idea. Um, if you are moving side to side, keeping your head at the same height, then um, then that might be deemed accidental. Um, if they are moving backwards, then that is intentional. Or like they're, they're static in the same way as if they were just standing there. Um, and then it also does say, uh, may give a warning, then apply further sanctions for repeated head height attempts, even at ranges longer than four minutes, if there is a cause for concern. Repeated is a little bit uh, wishy-washy, and I think that leads to players well players complain at different points some players might wait until six headshots have happened some players might wait until two headshots have happened i think it's somewhere in between um because you were allowed to throw high that's kind of it um and also you are allowed to throw high so when people don't get hit in the head but it still comes like whizzing past their head it feels like you're being targeted for headshots. You may or may not be correct about that. It's it's a bit tough because um, the player is well within their rights to do that. Uh, and it's kind of hard to know when you should give a warning for that. There's a bit of context with the ability of teams and the scoreline. Um, but certainly in a close, heated game can't really punish someone that never hits any headshots but always throws right here and right here and right here and never hits anyone in the head like that's completely fine but understandably players are worried by that because it can be intimidating if you're constantly being thrown at head height you got to realize that if the scoreline says 12 12 then there's not much you can do about that to argue because if you throw i think the implication is that if they don't throw at your head you're going to catch them um, and then another bit that I didn't highlight, that I will highlight here, 
Unsportsmanlike or unsafe behaviour from the target will not be tolerated and sanctioned accordingly. Not too sure what accordingly is that might be said somewhere later, but I just want to make the point that it could be sanctioned. Uh, when you move towards a thrower when already in close proximity with no ball in possession uh, and kneeling down. Kneeling, I guess, also meaning like lying. I don't know if you can... Uh, kneeling down. That specifically says kneeling down. Um, but a, a lot of players do this. They they may be looking for a rebound hit or trying to bait the person into throwing to make a catch. Um, and catches do get made in this situation. However... I understand why they believe it's dangerous for you to charge back at someone when you don't have a ball. It's a fair rule to add um, to for the for the safety of players. If it wasn't for the safety of players, if we didn't care about the safety of players, I think it adds a little bit of excitement and a little bit of um, risk, but number one is the safety of the players. So it does specifically say kneeling down. So if somebody steps back into your into the region holding a ball, then by the rules, it's actually not unsportsmanlike. Unless they initiate contact. But if they don't initiate contact, then it's actually fine. As soon as they kneel down, then book them. I think that's a little bit of a weird distinction to make. Um, because also, I mean, you can argue that when they're lying down, if they roll towards you and they don't hit you, then surely that seems a little more dangerous if they slide towards you, not on their knees. Uh, but it specifically says kneeling. Personally, I'm going to say this to, to the players, uh, I think some people do this to their own detriment and would actually do a lot better, with especially with the agility that they have, to just run away. <laughs> it's dodgeball. Um, sometimes in like 4v4 situations, you'll like you'll get the hit on the uh, as you come forward, and then the person will come up to counter, and the first step is towards them to try and get some deflection hit, when... I know that if you put in a big dodge, you've got like a 40-50% chance of getting out of the way of it. Um, like, just run away. You, you've got a better chance of surviving than if you like go and strand yourself in the middle of the court. Uh, yeah, that's just something that I've noticed that I think is weird anyway. I don't personally do this because I'd rather just get away. And I'm, I find more success with that than uh, what I see other people do when they just get themselves like stuck. Uh, and final point, just circling back, I think final point, I hope final point, uh, circling back to interfering with play, um, I highlighted this one because there's some good examples in here of stuff that is classed as interfering with play for assistant referees, um, and I just wanted to show that they, you know, they're trying to, trying to make this clear, it's just difficult because there's a lot of different situations. And um, this is about assistant referees, um, and you shouldn't interfere with play. Like an official should avoid interfering with play. This is about official, uh, assistant referees. Um, E.g., if an assistant referee takes one step onto court to take possession of a ball, which should be on another court so they can return it, whilst both teams are stood at the back of court, they should not be sanctioned if they interfere with be, uh, interfere with play by being hit by a ball. So you think that the play is completely calm. It is reasonable to expect that no one will throw, um, and you step on to. Uh, hit a ball off court and then someone throws and hits you it's not your fault like it's not your fault <laughs> uh, if however then this I'm sure this will never happen again uh, if, an, if, however, an assistant referee performs an action which clearly interferes with the game, such as stepping onto the court whilst a team is in the process of attacking or taking possession in the move, yeah, 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 yeah. If you block a ball that should have hit someone and it is reasonable that you can tell that there's a play going on, uh, you will be sanctioned. Uh, that did happen. It was funny um, for not the players involved, uh, although probably funny afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, so th there's... You know, there's a good example there of what interfering with play is for assistant referees for a thing that might happen quite a bit, um, for a thing that might happen in future. Okay, so that's kind of it. Hopefully that provides a bit more clarity and understanding on some of the rules that have changed. Um, give, me a, give me a comment or a message or something if you don't understand anything or think I've got anything wrong. Uh, otherwise, I'll catch you in the next one.